whatever. Okay. Okay. Um, just with everybody's permission, uh, I'm recording this. If anybody feels uncomfortable afterwards about me putting the recording on YouTube, then tell Reva, and um, otherwise I'll assume that everyone doesn't mind being recorded. Um, as it is Tammuz, I'm going to be speaking about the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash because we're coming up to Shiva Osa the Tammuz, and we're coming up to um, Tisha B'Av. So um, that, that's what I'd like to speak about this evening. And I entitled the talk, Mourning the Loss of Mourning, M-O-U-R-N, Connecting to and Commemorating the Loss of the Beis Hamikdash. Um, I'd like to uh, dedicate this for the Rafur Shalema of um, Yehudis Baskela. Um, may she have Rafur Shalema. Um, I was quite fascinated a few, by the way, if anybody wants to ask me or interrupt me or, you know, ask any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. I was thinking to myself a few years ago, what is it that we do in our daily lives to commemorate the destruction of the temple? So I'm happy to hear suggestions from the audience if anyone wants to unmute themselves. The breaking of the glass breaking at the wedding. Breaking of the glass at a wedding, thank you, Yochavet. Leaving a bit unpainted in your home or something. Yeah, what? thank you, Adele. Can Do you, you want to repeat, repeat that? Hava, can you repeat it? It wasn't very clear to me. Lee, uh, uh, Adele, do you want to repeat it? What mm -hmm. Adele said was when a person makes a new house for themselves, it's, a, it's a, a custom to leave a small area unpainted or unplastered. And it's it's zeche le churban. It's like a, uh, like a reminder of the churban. Not everybody does that. Yeah. Um, there, there are a few other things. We'll come across them later on today, um, hopefully. We also have the three weeks. So we start off, it's Tammuz. And the first part of Tammuz, you can still get married. It's all really lovely. Starts with Shiva Oska Tammuz. And then it sort of becomes the three weeks. Then it becomes... Like more serious with the nine days until we sort of like the, the crescendo, you know, like a, the down point is when we have Tisha B'Av where we don't, you know, we don't eat meat, we don't drink wine. And then eventually we're literally mourning as if the same way as a person would mourn the loss of a parent. What I was wondering is what actually happened when, when the temple was destroyed? How did people cope at that time? And what is it that they did? So what was the response of the people? Did they feel, you know, downtrodden and how are we going to get on? Or did they try and pick themselves up after the second temple was destroyed and try and rebuild? And so Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was a rabbi at the time, had to balance people not forgetting that the temple had been destroyed but the people of that generation were so traumatized by being there when the temple was destroyed and they were the ones that were scattered, you know, and <laughs> put in exile, they never forgot. So you have to balance like the people who don't remember it happening. I don't want to say they didn't care, but they only heard stories from their parents, grandparents, great grandparents, but the people who lived through it could not forget. And I'd like to share an idea that I heard with, uh, from Rabbi Joe Wolfson, who uh, works at New York University in Manhattan as the di director of Jewish learning and initiative in, in, in campuses. And he gave a talk once on a subject related to this. And he shared with us the Gemara in, in, uh, in Baba Basra 60B. Now I've got a handout, so you can, I'm going to share the screen now, just one second. If people don't like to see the screen, by all means, make the screen smaller. If you like to make me bigger and you like to see my face, then by all means, make me bigger, whatever suits you. And if you want to ask or interrupt, by all means, you can do that as well. Specifically, after the second temple was destroyed, there, were, there was not a community life. And there were, it seemed like there was no hope of redemption, unlike the first destruction where people had understood that perhaps there was the 70 years that they thought they would come back in. So this is the Gemara and Baba Basra. Um, can you see it? Can you see the handout? Yeah? Can someone see the handout on the screen? No, I have I not shared it properly. Right. Can you see it? Can someone tell me if they can see it? Yes, Hillary? Yes, you can yeah. see. It, it can says see. mourning the loss of mourning. Okay. Yes. 
So I'm going to be reading the Gemara Baba Basra and translating as I go along. I might not have the exact wording, you know, I'll try and, and, and make it as exact as possible. So Tona Rabbanon, number one. Shecharav Habayis Bashnia, that's when the second temple was destroyed, the rabbis taught, Rab, Rabu Purushim. Many Jews, many people became recluse. They became ascetics. They became hermits and they wanted to abstain from the pleasures of life. And they took it upon themselves because they were so sad that there was no temple that they thought, what I need to do is I can't, oh, one second, somebody's coming. And um, I, I, I cannot live. I need to show an expression of the mourning of the temple. And therefore, I can't eat meat and I can't win, drink wine. So they could have something, chosen something like oil, but at the time it was felt that it was too restrictive to tell people they couldn't use oil or they, people felt they couldn't live without oil. So Rabbi Yehoshua, who's Rabbi, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hanania, approximately 130 CE. So Niftalahem, number two, Niftalahem Rabbi Yehoshua. Rabbi Yehoshua tried to talk them out of it. Amalahem, he said to them, Bonai, my children, doesn't mean his literal children, why have you reacted like this? Why do you not eat meat and why do you not drink wine? The people who are obviously still traumatized and devastated from the loss of the temple, number three, Omrulo, they answered him, they said to him, How on earth can we eat meat and put meat in our mouth? when we no longer have the temple, we no longer have the base Hamikdash, and Hashem doesn't get sacrifices, how can we, in inverted commas, stuff our faces with the meat of the meat? We can't indulge in meat when we can't offer up meat sacrifices on the temple. The Nishte Yayin, how can we drink wine? Shemach, Shemach, al Gabe Mizbeach, Ba'ashav Batel, how can we off, drink wine when we can no longer offer up the sacrifice of wine on the, te on the temple? We don't have an altar on the temple. We're up to number four. Rabbi Yehoshua said to them in a sarcastic tone, Im Cain, if so, if you're going to give up meat and you're going to give up wine, lechem lo nochal. I've got an idea for you. If you want to be strict about this, do not drink, do not eat bread because flour was offered up on the, the, the on the car, carbonos were offered up on the mizbeach on the altar and if you if you're going to cut out meat and wine then if you're going to be serious about this don't eat bread so they replied uh, number five actually he was being sarcastic saying you know you want to be so strict upon yourself why aren't you why why don't you go with the full hog and here they replied, F shop appear us. What we're gonna do is it's possible to live on um, um, just the fruit. Fruit here in this context would mean the shivas haminim, like a pomegranate, grapes, and the grains of wheat and barley without them being made into bread and cake. Um, and then he said to them, because he never thought they were gonna say that, he says, number six, peros lo no chal. He said to them, no, I don't think you should eat fruit. Shekfa botlu bikurim. Because haven't you forgotten we offer up the first fruits in the temple and we're not doing that anymore. So if you're going to be serious about this, cut out fruit from your diet. Um, and, and then they said to him, number seven, Efshar bapeiros acherim. We can live eating other fruits. We won't eat pomegranates and grapes. We'll eat oranges, bananas, whatever fruit they might have had at that time, but not the shiva saminim. Um, I don't think that was the response that Rabbi uh, Yoshua was expecting. And so he says to them in a sarcastic tone even further, Mayim number eight, Mayim lo nishte. If you want to be serious, cut out drinking water. Shekfa batal nisuchamayim. Because there was something in the altar that was offered up on the altar called nisuchamayim, which was water libation, like pouring out water. We have the Simchas Bezda Shoeva on Shavuos, the Mishnah and Sukkah 42b um, talks about it, where we pray for rain. How were they supposed to respond? 
when he said, cut water out your diet. Nine, Shosku, they were quiet. Why on earth do you think they were quiet? Any, got, anyone got any comments about that? What made them be quiet? They didn't have a comeback for that. No, because they realized that um, uh, what they were saying didn't make that much sense because otherwise they might as well not eat at all. Because well, everything- they kind of said we can live on beer, right? <laughs> I don't think that they could live without water. Perhaps they realized, they understood that it was too, it was too strict. Um, anybody else got any other comments why they were quiet? There's no right or wrong answer. Whatever you say is right. Maybe they felt they couldn't connect with him because it was like, it was too, it was too restrictive to not have water as, as, um, as Jochebed says, but they, they had no answer for him. They realized that they were like put in a corner because they, if their excuse for why they weren't eating meat and drinking wine and, and fruit was all to do with the temple sacrifices, water was also part of the temple sacrifice and the temple service. So they, people took this upon themselves. One second, I think Adele's managed to lose herself. People put, took this upon themselves and perhaps they were too strict according to Rabbi Yeshua's opinion. Number 10. Rabbi Yehoshua said to them, Bo'u v'omar lachem, and come and I'll tell you, shelo lehis abel kol ikar iefsha, if we don't mourn at all, it's impossible. Shekfa nigzara gezera, because the issue has already been decreed that the temple has been destroyed. U lehis abel yote efsha, but if we mourn too much, um, but to mourn excessively, you're doing something that's also impossible because the sages cannot issue a decree upon the public unless the majority of the population are able to abide by it. So it says here, Fascinating that Rabbi Yoshua tells the people that the rabbis cannot make an enactment that is so stringent that people will think to themselves, I completely give up. If you want to take something stringent upon yourself, you can, but the rabbis cannot tell the community, you all have to be so strict on yourself by not drinking, by not eating fruit, by not drinking water, not drinking wine, and not eating meat. The temple has already been destroyed and there has to be some sort of mourning. So what is it that the rabbis told us we need to do? This is source two on your handout. I've actually put a link to the handout if anybody knows how to download it. If not, Reva can send it out afterwards. If anybody wants to read it themselves afterwards, maybe on Shiva Osvatamas or Tisha B'Av. Rabbi Yehoshua said, number 11. This is what the rabbis told us. Sod al dom es beso betzid, that a person, when they plaster their house with plaster, which Adele suggested, you keep a little bit of plaster as it was, don't paint it, leave a little bit of your house undecorated. Omar Rav Yosef, Amar al Amar, how much do you have to do? A cubit by a cubit. So, and then Rabbi Chista said, you should keep it opposite the entrance to your house so it's visible to all. Every time someone comes into your house, they see that there is um, a sign and a symbol in the, in the moment of happiness of you building a house and any party or visitors, if we could have visitors in our houses, that would come in would be able to see opposite the entrance to the house um, this square, which is between 48 and 58 centimeters square, depending. Um, uh, who you go with from Rabbi Chaim Noah until the Chazanish. So that's one thing that people do. Another thing, number 12. <clears throat> Sorry, if anybody wants to ask me, interrupt me by all means. I just okay. wanted to say that Rachel's actually down in her house here. She's got a square that she's um, sort of cut, cut out on the wall as you walk in. She did that everywhere. Very artistic. I'm sure it's very, very... <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Rabbi Yoshua continues, number 12, that a person, if they prepare a meal 
they should prepare everything, but leave out a small item. I don't know anybody who does that. So, um, and I don't know what a small item would be. Maybe that's why people had like more, more and more courses and we leave out one course. I'm not sure how that's practical today. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about this one. Number 13 is even less practical. It says, V'ose isha al tachshi teha v'mashayaret dova ma'ut. A woman, when they get dressed up for a beautiful occasion, they should leave out one small part of their jewelry. They shouldn't wear every single, they shouldn't adorn themselves so much. Again, I'm not sure how relevant that is today. But um, there was a commentator called the Ben Yohayada who says these three things are very interesting because the house, when you build a house, it's like as if it's like the Beis Hamidosh, the temple. The food, when we have a party or when we make a meal, we should leave something out because we offer up sacrifices on the altar of food. And the jewellery could be compared to the idea of the Kohen who was adorned with a Choshen and the tzitz and everything. So it's like those three things remind us of the temple. So those three things are things we should um, exclude. When we're making something, we should like have a tiny bit missing to remember the fact that the temple is destroyed. And then the Gemara quotes, Im eshkachech Yerushalayim, tishkach yemini, tidvak l'shoni l'chiki, im lo eskarechi, im lo a'ale es Yerushalayim, al rosh simchasi. This is a verse in Tehillim, Psalms 137, Tehillim kuf lamed zayin. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its cunning. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Now in Hebrew, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy is Al Rosh Simchasi. Now obviously we all know that song from weddings. The Gemara, number 15, I'm up to one second, asks, what's my Al Rosh Simchasi? What's above my highest joy? Rosh Simchasi, Rosh on my head. Omra Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak says, Ze Efe Mikle Shebarosh Hasanim. This is the source for it. I don't know how many people have managed to be like right there at the maybe at your at your uh, at your own wedding or at your son's wedding or your grandson's wedding. What they do is they take the rabbi puts ash, literally ash. I don't know if anybody's seen it onto the bridegroom's head as uh, remembering as like at your moment of your highest joy. Al rosh on your head. Al rosh simchasi on the peak of your joy. You also have on your head ashes, which should remind you of no happy occasion is complete without remembering the fact we do not have the temple. And Yochebed spoke about the breaking of the glass of the temple. So actually the source here, in source 15, tells us about the, the ashes that get put on the heads of the chasamim. And then again, source 16, Tanya, Amar Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha said, from the day that the temple was destroyed, din hu shenigza al atzmenu. It we we should have by rights decreed upon ourselves shelo nochal basar velo nishteyayin. We should have been strict and said, don't eat meat and don't drink don't drink wine. But the sages cannot issue a decree upon the whole community unless it's possible that the public can abide by it. Mourning for the temple should not be a tidal wave. Rather, it should be woven into the fabric of life because if we all take the Beis Hamikdash destruction to heart every day and we just literally, we would be like cathartic. We would not be able to get up and move on with our lives. I'm just gonna stop there for a minute if anybody would like to make a comment. Can I but say it's something? Isn't the Osama go on today? Um, it, it's, um, there was a strange custom, and the Lahabdil, in um, having spent a lot of my life in Catholic Ireland, on Ash Wednesday, which I think is before they start Lent, they go to church and they all come out with ash put on their foreheads. And I wonder if it originates from this. Oh. I don't know. Is there anybody who's an expert? No, I mean, I only know it because I lived in Ireland for over 40 years. <clears throat> That's very, very well, interesting. We've got some homework to do for next time, right? Mm. Yochebed, you wanted to say something? Yes, I find that in Jewish religion, 
Uh, God never wants us to give up everything because he's in there with the Nazir when he takes himself off and he, he makes do without what is it, wine and all sorts of things, the joys of life. His hair. Doesn't he have to come back and give a sacrifice? Yes, uh, yeah, Korban Khatos. There's lots of explanations as to why that is. Well, we, we are not a religion where we say we should be like monks and celibate. We're supposed okay. to live our life. Okay, look at source 17. It's, this is carrying on from the, from, the, from, the, from the Gemara, okay? And from the day that the wicked kingdom, we're talking about Rome, spread, who decreed evil and harsh decrees upon us and nullified Torah study and the performance of mitzvahs for us and did not, did not allow us to enter the celebrations of bris milah or pigeon haben. Anybody who was caught giving their son, circumcising their son was killed and the guests were killed. By right, we should decree upon ourselves. We shouldn't get married. This is number 18. We shouldn't give birth to children. But then what's going to happen if nobody moves forward in their lives? Um, the descendants of Abraham, our father, would die out by natural means. It's not the Romans are going to kill us. We're just going to kill ourselves by not carrying on the world and not procreating. Mm. But concerning this, this is the Gemara, um, Ella Israel, leave the Jews alone. Do not imp impose decrees by which they cannot abide. You cannot ask people to not get married and have children. First of all, the nation would die out on its own naturally. And second of all, you can't, it's, it's impossible to live like that. So the rabbis could not do that. They, the, the rabbis couldn't make a law that they didn't think that people would be able to keep. Number 19, it's better, mutaf sheyu yu shogakim, but al yu mezidin. It's better that they are unwittingly sinning than they are, that they be unwitting sinners and they don't know what they're doing is wrong. It's better that than they should be intentional, intentionally sinning. So don't put them in a difficult situation. So, I'm going to leave the Gomorrah there, and if anybody wants to look at it, obviously, I'll, I'll get Rebus part on the handout for you. But I'd like to change what I'm talking about completely. I'm talking about how to respond after tragedy and trauma. And for me, a lot of people speak um, um, on, on Tisha B'Av about the Holocaust, because to be honest, it's quite hard for me to relate to the destruction of the temple. And obviously, I had the good fortune. I flew out with Riva and Yocheva to Israel about three weeks ago. I don't know how long ago exactly. Um, but we, I went to Israel and I realized how fortunate we are and that we can, not everybody can go and how lucky we were. But after the temple was destroyed, what was it like for people? They, the temple was no longer there. The temple was so much part of their life. And on, on Tisha B'Av, people talk find it so difficult to connect to that so a lot of people talk about the destruction a more recent destruction and that of the holocaust and after the traumatic experience that people had in the holocaust they had to decide how to respond they had a choice what would they do and it is said that the Klausenberger Rebbe said after the war the biggest miracle of the of, of the post-war era is that anybody believes and keeps Torah and mitzvahs after the war. Now I'm going to just scroll down to the bottom of, uh, of, uh, of the sheet that I made and I'll, I'll go back up in a minute. This is based on um, uh, a psychology model called the Kubler-Ross uh, Kubler model, 1969, about the five stages of grief. And I don't know if you can see like the top bit, I'm pointing with the, the pointer, I don't know if you can see what I'm showing you. The top bit is like happy and the bottom bit sad. So the further down you go, the more sad you are, and the further up you go, right? So, you know, you're like living your life, suddenly you get a, you know, the shock sinks in and you sort of get like quite low and then you can't quite believe it. So you're like living a little bit in denial and like it hasn't quite sunk in. And then you sort of realize like the severity of the situation and you get so sort of like cathartic. And then you have a choice here of a pathway of either depression and crisis going down, 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 or you sort of can say to yourself, okay, I've got to find a way out of this and I've got to find something positive to do and I have to accept the situation. And as time goes on, 
you know, you'll have your ups and downs, but, you know, hopefully you'll land up there rather than, you know, down, down there. That's like a, an interesting um, a model of uh, response to grief that I found that I thought would be quite interesting. One second. Um, after the war, a lot of people, not a lot of people actually, right at the beginning, straight after the war, very few people wrote um, their memoirs or about their experiences. But one of the people who did write was written in Italian by a very famous writer called Primo Levi. Um, he passed away in 1987 and he was a chemist and he was a, a Holocaust survivor. And he published a book, I hope I'm saying it correctly for the Italians amongst us, Se questo è un uomo. I hope I'm saying it, in 1947, and it was translated into English. And he says the following, it's source 20 on your sheet. When people were affected in a very, very personal level by the Holocaust, where they went through and saw so much trauma, they had choices to make. And some people said, I'm you know, leaving, and other people said, I'm rebuilding. And I believe that there is some sort of parallel there to how people must have felt after the temple was destroyed. I'll read the English translation, source 20. Face to face with the sad evocative power of those places, i.e. the camps, each of us survivors behaves in a different manner. But it is possible to describe two typical categories, those who refuse to go back or even to discuss the matter belong to the first categories as those who would like to forget but do not succeed in doing so, and are tormented by nightmares. And those who have instead forgotten, dismissed everything, and begun again to live starting from zero. I have noticed that in general, all of these individuals who ended up in the camps through bad luck, that is without precise political or moral, or moral commitment, people who sort of got to the camps by bad luck and they weren't like, they didn't have a strong feeling. They didn't like give up their lives or want to be taken al Kiddush Hashem. For them, the suffering was tra a traumatic experience devoid of meaning, like misfortune or an illness. The memory is for them a kind of an extraneous thing, a painful mass that intruded in their lives, which they have sought or still seek to eliminate. The second category is composed of ex-political prisoners or those who possessed at least a measure of political preparation or religious conviction or a strong moral conscious, consciousness. For these survivors, remembering is a duty. They do not want to forget. And even more, they do not want the world to forget because they have understood that their experience was not meaningless. The camps were not accidental and unforeseen historical happening. And in your own community, I remember very fondly the late Solly Irving, who would go around, he pretty much dedicated his life to telling his story to the children all around the country to help them understand what had happened. So for him, it was so important to see meaning. And I know, for example, Mrs. Reedy Salt and Susan Pollock, you know, they should be Gesundheitsstark, they do the same. And there are many other people that I've grown up with and I've had the privilege to know, for example, Mr. Manfred Goldberg, who lives in the same street as me. And there are other people, for example, um, Zalmi Unstorfer's uh, late father who wrote the book, The Yellow Star. And there are other famous books like Vasily Grossman, who wrote Life and Fate, and Maus, the American cartoonist, or uh, uh, Spiegelman, who felt they had to do something and use something and make something meaningful out of the awful tragedy that they had faced. So the question is, do people find meaning after tragedy? How did people live after 9-11? So one idea was that people would, there would be a big baby boom or people would get divorced or people would get married because people felt, uh, um, according to the psychologist, Alan Hilfner, Hilfer, sorry, said that people had a deepening sense of commitment to family and they re-evaluated their goals and expectations of life. And after 9-11, um, this is a Dr. Yattle Fuchs of Long Island College Hospital. She spoke about people having a lot of babies. She said that people felt life is too short. When people see their mortality, they make decisions and they change things. 
I'm just going to leave out the next bit one second. Um, um, Howard Jacobson, the uh, journalist and uh, broadcaster and novelist, wrote in, in the introduction to the book, um, uh, Primo Levi's book, he says, the danger is, this is 22, the danger is, as time goes by, is we will tire of hearing about the Holocaust, grow not only weary, but disbelieving, and that out of fatigue and ignorance, more than cynicism, more than cynicism, we will belittle and by stages finally deny actively or by default the horror of the extermination camps and the witness by then by, uh, by the witness by then so many fading memories of those who experienced them the obligation to remember is inscribed on every holocaust memorial but even the words never forget become irksome eventually we do not like being reminding, reminded of our obligations. We do not want to go on taking the medicine, especially when we don't accept that we are sick. Now, Howard Jacobson wrote that about the Holocaust and how even, what are we, 75 plus years past the Holocaust and people are saying they'll forget. For me personally, I'm doing everything I can as a mother of children to expose my children to those people who have survived. So, and I've told my children, you have heard firsthand, you are, you are a testimony to the people like Solly Irving, who's no longer here to tell his story. You have to remember what happened. Like all of us are witnesses by hearing stories from the destruction of the temple. And we must never forget what happened. And the fact that we're still in exile because of the fact that people um, were guilty of sinat schinam, where they were not nice to each other, we still have to remember today our obligation to be as kind as possible to everybody and to teach our children to be kind to everybody or the children around us. I read something very moving, and if you want to look at it, um, you can look at it yourself. When the Ethiopians came to Israel, they did not know that the temple had been destroyed. They grew up thinking the temple was there. And when they found out that the temple was destroyed, they were in shock and they were so distraught. So there's a lady, her name is um, Michal Avera Samuel. In 2018, she wrote this, number 23 on her sheet. Up until the age of nine, I lived in the world where the Bet HaMikdash, the holy temple in the Jerusalem, actually existed. Like my parents and teachers, I believed the second temple stood in its place in Jerusalem and was literally made of pure gold. I grew up hearing of the Kohanim, the holy priests, how they worked in the temple. I fell asleep listening to stories about the halo hovering over Jerusalem and about the Jews who merited to dwell in the holy city cloaked in white garments, people blessed with pure hearts, clean thoughts, devoid of sin. Overhead, I would imagine the divine presence as angels. The ideal of Jerusalem was the force that provided us with the stamina to persevere during the arduous, arduous trek during, through the desert. It was the dream that kept us going. We wanted to reach it, to achieve it. We buried our beloved family members, left possessions behind willingly and lost them to vicious thieves. We struggled to keep going despite the terrible conditions and hunger only because of our goal to reach Jerusalem the gold and after so many generations stand at the gates of the temple. When we arrived and discovered the temple was, then we arrived and we discovered the temple had been destroyed. Jerusalem did not appear as the place I so badly yearned to reach. Learning about the destruction of the temple only as I reached the gates of the old city was an earth shattering disappointment and it left a great void in me that I have been unable to fill. I find that so moving because we've had the privilege to be able to travel to Israel and we, we've almost 
allowed ourselves to get used to the fact that we don't have the temple anymore. And we can see that at the time of the Gemara, that people were so shocked and they didn't know what to do. They couldn't move on with their lives. And for better and worse, because God's given us the power to forget, thank God, because if we remembered everything, our lives would be so terrible. But we also must, we mustn't forget what has happened. And we mustn't forget what we had. Um, the Baal Shem Tov says, one second, forgetfulness prolongs the exile. Remembrance is the secret of redemption. And one line I missed out, it was a continuation after source 15, I put right at the end, it's source 25, so we can finish this shiur today in a positive note. Kol hamis abel al Yerushalayim, zoche v'ro'er v'simchaso. If we can somehow find a way to connect to mourning for and commemorating the destruction of the temple, we will, if we mourn appropriately for the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, may we all merit to see um, its joy when it gets finally rebuilt, and may it be speedily in our days. Today would be fantastic. And if anybody wants to say anything or ask anything, I'm happy to like do a little a revision of the things I spoke about today. Can I just apologise that I wasn't here right at the beginning started, but I will listen to the recording afterwards. And I must say, I found it fascinating hearing what you had to say just now. Um, I know it's I'm going backwards to come forwards. Can I just give a resume of your wonderful career that you've had over the, the years? Uh, just so everybody should know. I know Hub has spoken to us many times. Really appreciate the fact that she's so willing me. Always says yes to me and never says no, which is a real pleasure because it doesn't always work like that. Hub is a qualified teacher, taught at Hasmonean School 10 years. She's a regular speaker at private homes and various schools. And last year, she was a scholar in residence to Chul. She currently manages the community website Kahila Northwest, that is org, and Kava attended Michlala Yerushalayim, where she achieved, and she achieved a BSc in accounting and finance at the LSE, and is also a graduate of the Susie Bradfield Women's Educational Program, and has completed a master's degree in property valuation and law at City University, and a further master's degree in Jewish education at LSJS through Perfect University. So she is thoroughly qualified to deliver many, many shiurim and has done and she continues to do for many years, please God. And in addition, Hava and her husband Danny, who I've known both of them since they were quite young, lives in London. And with her husband Danny, they have seven daughters, three sons-in-law and four grandchildren. And if anybody, you should have got hand out as well. I did say out to everybody uh, and I hope you downloaded it so that you can look at it when it's convenient for you if you want to look at it before Tisha B'Av or on Tisha B'Av, it'll be something to refer to. So um, has anybody got any questions? Please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll ask Adele to propose the vote of thanks. No questions? Okay, Adele, over to you. Uh, how do we get to Adele? Let me see if I can... That's unmute. Okay, I've done... Can you hear me now, people? Okay. Can you yeah, hear me, Hava? Like right. Um, we got sort of, I didn't only, I only discovered yesterday that Chava was going to be the speaker and I thought, oh good, this is going to be a good share. I am never disappointed, thank you very much. Something that we always take for granted, we sort of do it by role that we know, we fast, we, nine days, we don't eat meat and don't drink wine. Um, but and they're all about the breaking the glass and my bit with the, keep, the keeping the wall a bit uh, without paint. Um, it's just to sort of see just how far back that these mean hogging went was very, very interesting. And that quote from the Ethiopian uh, lady was so moving and that is how we should feel. And it's very, very hard to the Holocaust is we've got that, that we can relate to. Do, do we say Baruch Hashem, it's a silly thing that please God, 
um, as the other, at least we've got film testimony, testimony and proof of it, which we don't have of the uh, destruction of the Vesa uh, Mekdosh and so on. But it was fascinating and just so well researched from ancient texts to very modern texts. And thank you very much, Rava. Thank you for joining. There are other things, for example, some people, um, they wear, for example, when they go to the, to the, to the, to the um, Western Wall, they tear their clothes and we're supposed to be during the week, say, like Al Naharos Bovel at benching. And when we say the Amida, we say the Alira Shalayim or at say, and things like, you know, there are other things that people do. And some people, for example, in Jerusalem, they have the custom not to have music and wine. Not everybody does that at weddings, but that's like a custom that is documented. So it's very, it's very interesting what, what sort of things people have taken upon themselves. And some people, you know, if someone wants to take something upon themselves, it's OK. But we can see that the rabbis don't put things on the community. Anyway, listen, let's just hope that peace God still today. It's not too late. Reva's already got a head start. She's already in Israel and hope that we all merit to see the joy um, and Reva is unbelievable because she's been doing this women's group for I don't know how long, how many years, Reva? I think it's coming into 15 and please. Unbelievable. Please God, you should carry on having the strength and, uh, you know. Oh, please right. God, well, I'll have please to God we should all be having a yontif this year in Jerusalem and it won't be a tennis. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I'll be here eventually, but not quite yet. I'm coming home one day, everybody. So I'll see you all soon. Back <laughs> in good old Hendon. Thank you, Reba. Anyway, thank, thank you, you, you very much, everyone, much. for joining us. And thank lovely you, to see you all. Well. Keep good health. And Does anybody mind if I put this up on YouTube? If anybody minds, tell Reba if you don't want to say it loud. If you don't mind, then I'll put it up. Yes. Yeah, you can. I think Rabbi, um, I'm not even sure Rabbi Portnoy, he definitely puts it on the Shul website, but you can, as far as I'm concerned, it's with pleasure. We should see Everybody each other only simpers. simpers. Only simpers. Absolutely. Okay. Have a safe Thank journey you home. Make sure you have your PCR test before you go. No, I, yeah, I'm going on Friday, please go on. All booked. Okay. All right, you're All the best. All the best, Reva. I think she's got off. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Nice to everybody. Be well. Bye.
Hello, yes, I dropped off. I was trying, I was trying to sleep before, and of course I couldn't, you know, and uh, for this way I'd be awake and I just didn't fall asleep. And then I dropped off at the end. Um, yeah, yeah. Relaxation. <laughs> well, yeah. I was comfortable. Oh yes, yeah, I uh, I I love being my, in my own home actually. <laughs> yes, I'm all right. I'm all right. I, I was worried, but I'm fine. And I booked for I booked for Sukkot, but you can't book for the whole of Sukkot because uh, that's it. No more seats. Yeah. I, uh, British Airways. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so I'm going, uh, I'm staying here the first few days and I'm coming afterwards. Oh, gosh. Yeah, about. So I don't find the different day, like, can't get the doesn't matter. I don't mind staying two days here, lots of here. Yeah. And also, remember, I would have been away uh, in Israel yeah. until end of August. So, yeah, I don't mind having yeah. a few more days to catch up. I mean, I've had here, yeah. I've had so much work to do. It's been, yeah. you know, it's been with the kitchen, uh, things to put yeah. away, and it's been washing, ironing. Uh, it's been quite a bit. And then I had a lot to do uh, paperwork wise. And I had to, yeah. I wanted to transfer money with, um, with, a Yorkshire bank. A Riva, yeah. I wasn't sure about my password. We changed the password. At the time, we, we had no idea. I was actually, I, I was yeah. actually having a, a meltdown. It took two or three hours. And I said, you know what? I said, you know what? Your system is too difficult. I can do it with Barclays. And with your system, yeah. it was mad. And you have Fender Parfait, he comes me down and he, he, he taught me something else that I didn't know at the same time. I don't know enough to constantly deal with technology. It's constant. I've got the results of my PCR test. I've no idea how to do it. You know, it's, 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 it's I don't know, it says, I don't know, password, it's best. Yeah, but they say password. When they ask me for a password, that's it. I'm lost every single time. So oh, I don't care. I'm sure it's negative. It wasn't very pleasant. You know, they still couldn't because I can't have something going down my throat. I gag. I gag. Anyway, and Temple Fortune. Oh my goodness. I'm not doing it there again. Well, I'll tell you where it is. It's not, um, I went through bread. You know where bread, the restaurant is? Right, you follow the road and you turn right. But I think if you just follow the main road further down, then it's easier. It's easier. Oh, you know where it is. Well, I do know where it was. They don't do it in Golders Green anymore. Because it was too complicated having two venues. So now they've only got one venue. Now I must tell you something. I went out with Lydia and her husband today, Lydia Shohan and her husband. We went to Grand Cross and then and then Lydia said, should we see if we can have a drink upstairs? I said they do track and trace. So anyway, I said, you know what? Let's sit down at Neho. I don't need to rest anyway. It's absolutely gorgeous, by the way, but it's then vivid. It's really, really nice. Uh, yeah, so I said, you know what? I'm going to go up and I'll pretend nothing. I just asked for a coffee, see what happens. They didn't ask anything either. They didn't ask anything. So I know now to go there when it rains. So today was too hot to be out. So, um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So uh, we just said we won't go out. I said, no, I'm fine with that. 
and um, yeah. we went to Rigman, uh, Rigman, TK Max first, and then popped into next. I was looking for a white kettle to match my new kitchen, and then and, oh, you know, my kitchen is just good. My kitchen is just fabulous, and then we oh, it's absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. And then I went to um, we went to what did we do? John Lewis that didn't have, and I found one in Phoenix, a kettle in Phoenix. So that's why why we went we went upstairs, and then went to yeah. to do a bit of food shopping because, because I tried uh, pesto yeah. delivery all by myself, but I can't do it. I just can't do I can't do anything like that. I must tell you that's one thing I think I'm not sure I'm trying to do again. Well, I was doing it, I was doing it, it seemed to work, and then they cancelled it. So I think I know why now. I can't speak to Ellie, she's working too hard, I can't ask her anything. I just feel it's mean. I just, you know, I, I've just left it. So then I, what? I'm listening. Yes, yes. Oh, no, no, Ellie, on a Sunday she'll do it. She'll do it on a Saturday as well. Um, right. Then Yoshika or Ellie would, uh, Ellie would, but you know, I was back and then I thought I'd do it. It seemed to work. I was so excited. And then I think what you've got to do is order one item. And then once you've ordered one item, they secure the slot for you. I think that's what I think that's what happened. Oh, um, Ellie's always done it like this for me, so that must be it. That's what I think. Anyway, this thing just worked. And then, and it's not finished. Then I had to. I'm going to the dentist tomorrow morning. Well, would you believe you've got? You've also got to fill in things. Tick, 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 tick. Oh, I know. Yeah, I've done it every time. I've got to do it. Oh. Why don't we go together? We don't tell them. It's stupid. stupid. So I had to do that as well. I tell you, I mean, Lydia said let's go out in the morning. I said, no, 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 I can't. I wanted to go shopping and I, I, I couldn't. I mean, ridiculous. So when we were at Grand Cross, I said, can we go to Martha and buy a bit of the, I wanted to make myself, I fancied some vegetable soup. So because Gabby made me a lovely vegetable soup and I fancied it. So we did it, she needed to shop as well, so it worked. But she's got in a hurry anyway. She said, which was fine. You know, I didn't have a problem. Yeah, 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 she went with her husband. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was very nice, very nice. I think we sat and we sat and we chatted and we chatted. It was good, it was good, but they've done it in very uh, relaxing colors, Mabel. You sit there and you just feel, I don't know what it is. Very calming effect. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really nice. I thought they've extend, they extended it with, they used to have a posh children's shoes. And now it's been taken yeah. over by Merrill. And they've done it very nicely. Really, it was interesting. I hadn't seen it. And then I really cut the clothes. I mean, I hadn't seen it before. They had nothing sure. new for a long time. So it was fun. Just fun, it was good, it was good. So tomorrow it's the day, I know, and I've got a doctor's appointment. My back, itch, itch, itch. And my back is itching because the trim she's given me doesn't work. So I've had enough. So I went back on to patches and I said, I don't think a photo gives a true picture of what it is. Somebody needs to look at it. And you get a question, I got a question like, do you, do you know, do you think you know what it is? Do you, do you think you know what to do about it? And I'm thinking, well, that's like, exactly. <laughs> that's why I'm going to a doctor, oh, honestly. That's right, you know, doctor, it's not doctor, heal yourself, it's everybody heal yourself. Anyway, so I'm going tomorrow evening. So morning is dentist, evening is doctor. Now that's it in one day. 
Oh, I haven't done, I didn't do that at all. She's actually stuck. I didn't know what happened to where everybody was. They had to call you guys, and no more call you guys, but I don't know what everybody else was. So you know, we had a good round, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But she was very good because it was different. Yeah, it was quite interesting. Yeah, it was quite interesting. Yeah. Now it's interesting the Jewish attitude to women. Yeah, it's quite interesting. 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 A lot of periods when you're not allowed to do this, that, or the other, but right, nothing yeah. is extreme, is it? Because it's not accepted by Jewish yeah. law. But not only that, you think about Shiva, think what a wonderful thing. Oh, well, Shiva is very special. It's, you know, it's such a clever thing. thing. It's so special. You know, yeah. I remember somebody, somebody told me years ago about she had a friend who was not Jewish, she was telling her about it. And she said, I think it's the most wonderful idea because everybody can be comforting. And, and to have it's like a buffer it's the after mm. the riot. Yeah. And you've got that week where you are constantly surrounded by people, and family, and friends. It's amazing. It makes it all right. It's hard to get back to life after it's but it has that buffer to soften. Oh, I agree. I agree. 100%. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen yeah. it you know, in non Jews not having a shiva. And how it affects them. They can't cope. Afterwards, I remember somebody who in the end couldn't cope because he said he had no period of mourning. Went straight back to work. And then, I mean, Jewish religion is quite clever. It's very clever. I think our Jews are very clever for so many things. You know, even like washing our hands before we eat a meal and making our army make a rocker and we eat bread. But the idea is that you wash your hands. Think of all the cleanliness and, and how many lives have been saved, especially in times of plagues and things like that, going back hundreds of years. Uh, you know, people were saved because of this one oh, wonderful thing that we clean, we wash our hands all the time. Well, again, it's amazing. Yeah, but I mean, uh, if you go to Harvey Dean's houses, they're not terribly clean, are they? Say, what? Harvey Dean's houses aren't very oh, clean. Harry, Oh, ha, ha, ha. They're clean for Pacer. They're clean for Pacer. Thank God we've got Pacer. Well, I don't know. Sugar, but the fact that 
they have chosen to live such a life. And he says, I've got no television. My children don't know what it is to have a computer or to have a, a you know, a tablet or anything. They've got no connection whatsoever. And they live and they're happy and they But he talks to them about life, he talks to them about different things. And it's not that they, they're different, you know what I mean? And I think this book, reading this message was quite, and, and really quite extraordinary. So you don't see something like that very Yes, but you see, he's probably more special. I don't think the majority's yeah. like that. The majority's not tolerant. The majority, you know, it's uh, you've got to be like them, otherwise they don't look at you. Well, a woman can look at another woman. But you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, um, you know, apart from the baggage, who are the opposite. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. anyway, anyway, right, yeah. okay. Yeah. I shall now yeah. get ready for bed. Okay. Uh, I hope, well, I'm not. Oh, you're lucky. You're lucky I, I finished yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very long series. Yeah, well, I finished it. What a shame. You know, when I finish a good one, I'm always, I'm always yeah. upset. Yeah, but I've got yeah, Gisela like I haven't that. watched yet, so that's all right. Oh, and I've, no, because yeah. I couldn't watch it in Israel. Why? I kept it for Israel and I couldn't watch it. You're not allowed to watch Why? it in Israel. I don't know. Uh, well, but I said, no, you can't. You've got a special app to cheat to try and see. Uh, so I said, you know what? Yeah. I can watch it at home. It's all right. So I did watch it. Yeah. Well, I will. I will. Okay, it. It's very yeah, it's good. Then I've yeah, read. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, enjoy for my agents. I will. Yes, yeah. How many cards are going to have to be made? I don't know. I must be down and work it out. Yeah. I think at least, at least half a dozen. Let's put it that way. Are they getting yeah, better and better? Yes. Yeah, they're definitely improving. Yeah, I'll send you a photo of the latest one. The, the one before this, I'm going to give it to my daughter, my grand daughter in law for her baby on Sunday, on Friday, to go out for breakfast on Friday morning. Now, I'm going to have my COVID tested yet, which is much time than what I told. Oh, lovely. Uh, and then I think I'm not sure what job is coming in for Shabbos on the whole bench. I'm not quite sure. This is my last Shabbos. Now, I guess you're going to be on Sunday morning, and I'm going to have a thing to me. I'm going to spend a bit of time in Israel in future, aren't you? Yeah, please go. Yeah. Thanks, God. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay Good night. Bye. Bye.